uh, make sure you all destroy it in a way that is environmentally sound. Remember when we mentioned the chain of custody when we saw those uh, those uh, evidence collection containers? It's got to have information on it. What the stuff is, it might be arson evidence, it might be uh, bodily fluids, who knows? Uh, mention who collected it, where, when, and as we mentioned, you must have the chain of custody. You must have it. It must be known. That's who contacted it and who controls it. And anyone who opens it to examine it or to do laboratory tests on it, they have to reseal it and make a note that they opened it so people know, oh yes, this was not uh, directly from the crime scene. Someone else checked it out and you know who it is. And when the second person you know, wants to examine it, they too will make a note of that they opened it and uh, even though they might have to reseal it later. Fact is, everybody who touches uh, or examines the evidence, even if it's just to, to pull it out of the bag and put it on the laboratory bench, they might be required to testify in court. So everybody must be written down. The chain of custody must be very clear. Now, something that's overlooked often is evidence relative to things that are not evidence. What they call standard samples or reference samples. They're also called substrate controls. So, uh, for example, um, it's a, what is a sample whose identity and source are known? If you have, let's say, fiber evidence at a murder scene, what you have is, let's say, there's a fiber on the dead body. You not only have to collect that as evidence, you have to collect, from the victim, for example, you also collect the fibers of the carpet that the dead body is on. Because maybe that fiber actually came from his own uh, carpet. Maybe, uh, so, you have to know this. So don't just take the sample, the evidence from the sample that you think is evidence. Take it from places around it so you can compare it to know whether it really is evidence or just a part of the crime scene. That's not evidence. So, and, uh, so that's like, um, so again, uh, that's a sample close to the crime scene and it may have been affected by a crime but not destroyed by it. Take it. Even though it's it maybe may not be evidence, but it's something to compare the evidence to. Uh, cases of arson are another example that where the fire started. See if they have accelerant, uh, accelerant, let's say gasoline in that place to make it go faster. But got to check it out in the rest of the house too, because what if there's gasoline all over the house? What if the person sold gasoline or you know uh, like you know having gasoline projects all over his house? So that doesn't that proves that, or it doesn't prove that there was an accelerant. It was arson. It could be the person had gasoline all over his house. Check the rest of the house too. So you need to have you need to have samples of places other than the the exact place of crime, or other than what you think is evidence. And unfortunately, this is often overlooked, but it has to be done. It's very important. It's true for cars also. Also, when you, uh, again, when the person at the crime scene, he collects the evidence, he has the evidence, when it's sent to the lab, you must fill out a form. It's not just bureaucratic nonsense. It's very important because the forensic laboratory has to know what kind of test they should do. Here's an example of these forms. Type of offense, you know, it might be a, it might be a homicide, uh, in which case they might be checking for a gunshot, uh, you know, a residue. Or something else. But if they don't know what kind of a crime, again, they might not think of things like that. Uh, or maybe it was a knife done by knife. Maybe there's a lot more bodily fluids to check for. Here is so again, who did it come from? The you know the perpetrator, the victim. Sometimes there's more evidence on the victim. Sometimes uh, you might have to check them harder if it's on the perpetrator because they might have brushed off their clothing or something like that. So they might have to look differently. So you have to know where the evidence came, where, where it was found. And again, a, a brief description of the location. And this is just an example of uh, an evidence submission form. These are important, not just uh, you know, to uh, make you know, lawyers happy, but also so that the forensics laboratory will know how to check for it in a better way, in a more efficient way. Well, we are talking about the crime scene, and we have to mention the Fourth Amendment. You're not allowed to seize property. You're not allowed to search through property that does not belong to you without a search warrant. Warrants are only issued by judges if there is probable cause. You can't just walk into somebody's house and try to collect evidence. 
of, you know, this goes way back to the to the Revolutionary War. One of the problems you'll find in the Declaration of Independence of what the, the what the British people were doing while they wanted to get independence, they would they would go into the colonists' houses and just search them and ransack the place, you know, without any reason, and there was no way to complain. So the start of the country was we've got to have something to stop this from happening. So it's in our it's in our Constitution, it's the Fourth Amendment, that no one is allowed, no no government official is allowed to enter your house without a good reason. And it has to be established by someone uh, who can do that, a judge usually, um, and there must be probable cause. They will not give you a warrant without it. Now, this is true usually, but there are cases that are exceptions, like in an emergency. Let's say someone hears someone screaming for help in a, in a, in a house. You can't go to a judge for a warrant in that case. In an emergency situation, um, the police are allowed to bust down the door and run in there. Now, there are things they're not allowed to do. They're not allowed to be uh, searching where the cry obviously didn't come from. They're not allowed um, there. Uh, once they find the source of the cry, they can't keep searching. Um, unless there's some other reason. Another reason is if evidence is going to be destroyed. You can't wait for a warrant. If you think evidence is going to be destroyed, you, you must, um, you can't, you'd have to. Uh, try to get that evidence as soon as possible. Or consent can be given. Uh, the person says, okay, I don't want you go and search my place. Okay, if they, uh, they're they that confident, uh, then uh, then you can, you, can, you can search that place. Now, this is not just the person who happens to be living there at the time. Let's say a person in an apartment, and the owner reserved the right to walk in. Now, the owner can say, hey, I want you to search that place, just like the owner can say, I'm allowed to go inside that place. I'm allowing the police to go in there. So uh, that's another thing. Another time that probable, another time that it's possible to go into a place without a warrant. But be, but if this is ever done, they must justify what they searched for and how. So uh, get a warrant before you do any of this, uh, before you do any of these searches for uh, for for possible evidence. The reason why is if you have evidence without a war warrant, it is useless, and this is very de depressing, very uh, you know disheartening and discouraging. When crime labs might work for a week or a month getting getting um, getting the evidence and actually coming with a good you know w w w with a good answer, something that can be used to show guilt or innocence, and having the whole thing thrown out entirely because the person collected without a warrant. It's more than just disheartening to the forensic people. It's dangerous to society. Here's a case of Mincy versus Arizona in 1978. Um, police suspected him. They went into his house and his garage. And they did not have a warrant. They um, uh, might have claimed that, oh, they thought he was guilty or whatever it might have been. The fact is they found all the evidence they ever wanted. Guns, drugs, bullets, everything. This guy was guilty. He was a danger to society. He had to be put away. But guess what happened? They said he was. They uh, said he was n entirely not guilty, and he was allowed to go free to do all kinds of crimes before he was. I think he was caught again. But he was allowed to go free because they did not have a warrant. Now you might be arguing. Uh, this is like a like a um, uh, philosophical or moral argument. Look. If the guy is guilty, so what if they didn't have a warrant? Fine, you punish the policeman for entering without a warrant. But if he's guilty, he's got to be stopped. Even though...